First of all, welcome to Digit Debates this term. Um, happy International Women's Day for those who like celebrating these things. I'm very, I'm absolutely delighted to have Heather here to come to talk to us about the work she's been conducting in Silicon Valley on uh, women in the tech industry and using some really original, interesting data from Glassdoor. Heather is a um, very distinguished professor at the University of California, Berkeley. She's a professor of sociology and organizational studies. And she is really represents somebody with a massive interdisciplinary approach to her research. And I really also have had discussions with Heather in the past. It's very much about combining theory with empirical evidence, drawing on whether it's history, sociology, management studies, um, economic geography or computational linguistics. And her most recent book, which I really recommend, is called The Power of Organizations by Princeton University Press. And that's absolutely worth having a look at to read about some of the ways organizations can be understood and digital challenges amongst them. It's a very short version. Well, Heather, um, I'll hand over to you and we look forward very much to your presentation and thank you to everybody who's come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. And I'm really delighted to be here. Um, sorry. You would think I would know how to share a screen after <clears throat> two and a half years of this, three years of this. Um, and it seems that International Women's Day is indeed um, a great day for this kind of thing. Um, just delete boxes there. Okay, so um, I'm really glad to be doing this because I think this fits the digital futures at work because it's about companies who are creating all the digital features at work at the core of that, the tech sector. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-author, Jasmine Sanders, who's a PhD student in um, sociology at the business school, uh, sociology and, and um, here at Berkeley. And I want to thank Will Razia, who's the first of those three people who just popped up on the screen, a doctoral student in sociology, who worked as a data analyst at Microsoft before he came. So his coding skills have come in handy on this project. Um, Nora Jagia, who was an undergraduate, just graduated last year, who spent a year, two years working as an apprentice on this project with us, and Emily Guo, um, who spent the last year and a half working with us on this. So they have done a lot of the coding work because me and Python are not very good friends, and that's the language that this analysis is mostly done in. Okay, so we're talking about work-life balance and corporate norms and practices that affect it, um, and sort of the structures and context that make it more or less likely that people will be happy or sad about their work-life balance. Okay, so let's explain what work-life balance is, right? You can think about it in three places, three ways, time, location, and boundaries. So let me start with boundaries. People draw mental boundaries between spheres of life. This is um, based on research by a cognitive sociologist, maybe the only cognitive sociologist, Aviatar Zerubavel. Um, and in particular, people start, strive to separate work from life outside of work, right? We've known about this for 25 years. Um, and one of the things that happens from the mound of research that's done on this is that lack of separation between work and life outside work is stressful for people. Um, so we, it, it causes the stress if our roles overlap, <clears throat> which has serious um, and mental and physical health challenges that I'll explain later. Now, the second thing to recognize is that in many US organizations, and I'm sure in many UK organizations, the ideal worker is male. This is, again, decades of research by feminist scholars have brought this up, and work is male type. What this means is that we design jobs based on the assumption that the person is going to be able to do, get their all to work and have their spouse, usually a female spouse, handle all chores outside of work, home stuff, child stuff, things about dry cleaning, whatever, house repairs, um, and this idea means that people think about the main worker as male. They think about jobs as male type. They design procedures and, and policies that favor men. Um, and there are also cultural spillovers, perceptions that women don't fit and women can't do the work because it's something that men do. Um, the other idea is that this ideal workers give their all to work, that nothing outside of work should interfere with their work because they have this spouse who can handle everything outside. I remember Ms. Magazine had a cover about how I want a wife in the 1980s, and I feel that way still, although I have a devoted husband. Okay, in the US, women do more domestic labor than men. That's also true in the UK. 
Um, this means things like housework, child and elder care, and also the mental and cognitive burdens of planning and scheduling. So that means that women face competing devotional demands. They have to be devoted to women who work outside the home. They have to be devoted to work and they have to be devoted to home. And that is more of a conflict for them or more competition for their time and energy than uh, it is for men because men do less, um, have less good devotion to home um, in terms of the time and effort they spend. And that means women find it harder to give their all to be the ideal worker um, at, um, at any time. Okay, the impact of not having work-life balance, so that having instead work-life conflict is, as I mentioned, stress. So declines in mental and physical health ensue. Um, and there's spillovers to family ties. Um, there's been evidence of fighting divorce, estranged or unhappy children. Um, and then the end result, which has a huge impact on the organizations and, and the people who run them, is that uh, people burn out and they exit. They slow down their work and they exit. Now, it's true that women and workers with small children suffer the most based on really recent research by Aaron Kelly and Phyllis Moen. But this research, uh, this research shows that this affects all workers, even young single men without family obligations who want a life outside of work. Okay, so we're asking two research questions. Who pays attention to work-life balance? And what do they think about work-life balance? Um, we wanna know which employees and which organizations discuss work-life balance. We also want to ask what work-life balance means to employees and how it plays out on the ground um, in terms of firm norms and practices. Um, so we're going to start with who pays attention, what do they think, and then we'll worry about practices and norms in another paper. Okay, so the relationship between gender and work-life balance mentioning it is simple. Because women do more household labor than men, work-life balance should be more salient to women than it is to men. And so they'd be more likely to bring it up when they talk about their companies and their jobs. Um, the relationship with age is more complex. Um, so first of all, younger, younger workers are often single and childless. Um, second, older workers have older children who go to school and have after school activities and are less likely to kill themselves if you're not there to look after themselves, relatively self-sufficient at home. This is a childless person telling you this, right? Um, and that means that work-life balance is most salient to people who are, sorry, try to put that up, people who are in the middle of the age range, people who are most likely to have young children are based on US statistics, people in their 30s to early 40s, um, young children at home. Um, that means that people who have young children, people in the middle of the age range, are most likely to bring up work-life balance. We also believe that age uh, should accentuate the gender gap in talking about work-life balance. Um, it should moderate that relationship. Because female workers do more domestic labor than men, um, and workers in the middle of the age range have more childcare responsibilities, so it should be women who are in the middle of the age range with small children, at, who are more likely to have small children at home, who um, are most likely to talk about work-life balance. Now, I haven't mentioned the second dependent variable, which is sentiment or expressed opinion about the work-life balance as positive, neutral, or negative. Our predictions for that depend on the relationship between the salience of work-life balance, the likelihood of people bringing it up, um, and their opinion. That relationship could be positive. So the more people mention it, they could be mentioning it because they're happy at work and they want others who might work in their companies to know about this when they talk about it. Um, or it could be negative, they're bringing it up because they're unhappy with work-life balance. And so um, that means that um, that means that women would be more likely to have ne express negative sentiment. Or it could be that women, if they do bring it up, express positive sentiment. We'll see how this plays out. The same thing happens when you think about age. Okay. So as an org theorist, I know you can't just think about workers in the abstract, um, and you can't rely on individual characteristics like in, um, and gender and age to think about their behavior. You have to pay attention to context. So here, oops, we're going to talk about context um, in two uh, important um, ways that we can also measure reliably in our data. Um, so first of all, organizational size, which is the most studied aspect of organizations because it affects so many parts of it. And the second, firm ownership in terms of whether a firm is publicly traded on a stock exchange or just privately held. <clears throat> I'm going to contrast publicly traded and large firms with privately held and small firms. 
Publicly traded and larger firms have more financial resources than privately held and smaller firms, so they can afford to spend more to help workers balance um, work and life outside of work. They're also more visible, so that they um, are more pressure. They experience more pressure to conform to social norms, which may force them to um, help employees balance work and life outside of work. Finally. Larger and um, publicly traded firms have more fo formal rules and procedures than smaller and privately held firms. These formal rules and procedures reduce managers' discretion, um, in, including the discretion to press employees to work around the clock and give all that they can to work. So if publicly traded and larger firms are more likely than privately held and smaller ones to help their employees balance work and life outside of work, than any observed gender difference in mentioning work-life balance or an expressed sentiment about it should be less in larger and publicly traded firms. Okay, those are all of our explanations and arguments. Um, now I wanna talk about the research side and the data a little bit um, and then how we go about studying work-life balance. So we're studying the tech sector for four reasons. One, it's highly innovative, and that has a huge impact on economic development in any country. Second, it's a high growth industry, which offers employees um, opportunities for upward mobility um, and career um, achievement. Third, it has high productivity and profits. So it's it's much more, it's, it contributes, the tech sector contributes much more to the US economy than um, it's than the number of people or the dollars invested in it, um, which means it's economically critical. And third, because of the profits they, uh, tech firms offer is high pay. So high pay is a great thing for employees. So we're worried about women not have feeling comfortable or, or feeling that they fit in in these firms and women finding that they can't work there because of work-life balance. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, so we know there's gender inequality in tech. In fact, this project began with the title, Tech as a Gender Problem. And then I thought I probably should put the conclusion after I had the results of the analysis, so I changed it. Um, you can see this if you look at demographics. So the fraction of women in red versus men in blue um, among executives and managers in the tech sector is about half of what it is in US privately held firms as a whole. The, the fraction of women who are professionals or all employees in the tech sector, about 28%, is about 50% below the fraction in the U.S. private sector employees as a whole. So there are fewer women in tech than there are in other fields of uh, the economy. So it's not just demographics, though. It's also culture, norms, and values and practices. So journalists like Emily Chang, um, tech workers like Susan Fowler, um, who wrote an amazing blog post about her sexual discrimination at uh, sexual harassment at Uber in 2017. Um, and, and sociologists and management scholars like Shelley Corral have demonstrated that there's a that there, the tech sector suffers from a sometimes toxic in some locations in some places atmosphere that leads women to feel alienated from their firms. So how does this play out when we think about work-life balance, which is a big issue for um, gender equality? Okay, well, we have to get an empirical purchase on this. The way we do this is um, to use employee discourse, what employees say about their companies, which we think explains what they think about their companies. So language provides us insights into what people think and feel about their workplaces, their mental models or cognitive schemas. Um, we have a long history of ethnographic and interview-based research studying organizational cultures and occupational cultures using the language that people talk about as ways to get insight into that. Um, we build on that in a larger and computational way. Uh, we're looking at two aspects of what people say, content and context. So content, we're focusing on the presence or frequency of words or phrases. Um, so the more people talk about something, the more central it is to their understandings, um, to, their, the, to the culture, and also the more likely it is that it's something important that happens at work in terms of practices. Note, what people say does not mean it's something they value. It could be something that they um, di di disdain, or it could be something that's contested. People may talk about some aspect of their workplace in very different ways. Um, that's not what we're concerned about right now, but content does not mean value. 
The second thing that we pay attention to when we, when we study language is context. So the meaning of any word or phrase comes from the words and punctuation marks around it. Um, so explanation marks provide emphasis, for instance. Um, so the meaning, including its valence, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral, comes from the words surrounding it. And we're going to leverage that knowledge from link, uh, linguistics from 70 years ago to um, our analysis today. Okay, so we want to ask two questions. How much do employees discuss specific workplace practices that, that relate to work-life balance? The more they discuss it, the more salient it is to them. When they do discuss a specific set of workplace practices or outcomes for them, work-life balance, how do they talk about them? When we talk about them, we're talking about are they happy, sad, or neutral when they discuss them? Okay, so as um, Jackie mentioned, we have data from Glassdoor. We have employee reviews of tech sector firms over seven years. Um, these are the nine industries in which large publicly traded Silicon Valley firms operate. So I decided, seems like a good definition of tech. Notice that FinTech and um, Nanotech and Biotech aren't in here, but that's okay. We can look at those separately if we want to. Um, we've got a million reviews. When we do some cleaning up, we get rid of all the short reviews because they demonstrate lack of attention to the task. Um, and reviews that are not in English, because we know they don't, because automatically we take them out if they don't contain English words like a, uh, and, the, not, or in, um, which are often called stock words, um, which leaves us with 950,000 reviews to study, more than anyone can read. So we use a computer to read them. When we drop reviews without information on gender, that's 42% of the sample, we ended with 550,000 reviews. Um, and so, we know for 58% that people have self-reported that they're male or female. No one self-reported being anything other than male or female. So that's the binary that we're stuck with for this analysis. Um, we drop When we drop reviews without information on age, we're down to a quarter of a million. Only a quarter of a million reviews. Still too much for me to read. So we have a computer do it. About a quarter of the reviews across the entire data set um, and across the data set that we study for the impact of gender and the impact of gender and age jointly, I mentioned work-life balance. So it's moderately well mentioned. It's mentioned a little bit less than compensation, um, but it's mentioned more often than things like food or you know, free food, which is common in Silicon Valley firms. Um, reviews express employees' own perceptions. They provide, as I mentioned before, a window into what they think matters in the company, whether they like it or not, right? Um, and they also mentioned things that actually happen in the company on the ground practices. All right, so here's an example review from Glassdoor. Here's a, you go into companies, you look for something from Apple. Here's the Apple headquarters, which looks like a spaceship. Um, and here's a, a review. Um, you can see that they, it's titled um, and there's pros, cons, and optional advice to management. We work with geniuses in every department, like this person has drunk the Kool-Aid, except there isn't any work-life balance. I chose this review as an example just because it doesn't, there's no work-life balance here. Um, that's the kind of text we're analyzing. Here's another review that really does not like Apple. Um, and it's, okay, so they have a brand and the stock's been doing really well so far. Oh yes, cons, no work-life balance. Managers don't care about work satisfaction. So they have disagreements in whether they really like the company or not, but they have pros versus cons, very different views. This one also has advice to management, which, as I said, was optional. So we're going to look at these three sections of these reviews separately, pros, cons, and advice to management when we do the analysis. Okay, so to do this analysis, we have to figure out how to explain it. Right. So we have to have a purchase on it. So you can think about work-life balance, as I said before, in terms of time and location, in terms of whether that's devoted to family care or not, and in general terms. So we have I developed a lexicon based on reading the literature on work-life balance and hundreds of reviews, um, giving example terms here. Then I took my lit lexicon and we extended um, by using a computer to come up with words that were similar to the words in the lexicon to make sure that the lexicon was complete. For example, baby and babies were not in the lexicon originally, but they got added. Um, okay, so 
We also want to know about the discourse, right? So we're doing what's called a sentiment analysis, and that's a little wheel with lots of different emotions on it. Um, we use a computer algorithm from the Natural Language Toolkit, which is a family of Python tools to analyze short texts like the descriptions um, and that we analyze. We use a specific algorithm within that, which has a terrible name, Vader. Computer scientists have no idea how to come up with good acronyms. Um, this uses a highly validated lexicon of emotion terms and rules, plus grammar and syntax. They analyze that to come up with scores of how positive, negative, or neutral words are. So for individual words, they start with human coding. Um, 10 people coded individual words based um, as being positive, negative, or neutral on a plus and minus four to plus four scale. Um, here's some examples from the Vader lexicon. Okay is positive. Good is po more positive. Great is more positive. Horrible is negative. Um, this analysis lexicon performs as well or better than human coders for short texts like the ones we study. It because partly because it's also not just taking individual words, but it recognizes things like degree modifiers vary, polarity shifts, however or but, and complex negations like the weather isn't really all that hot. And it takes the polarity for all the words in the text that you're studying and generates a score from negative one to ne from for most negative to positive one for most positive for a text, um, plus the fraction of a text meaning that is positive, negative, or neutral. Here are some examples of what it does, because it's like a really cool idea. So here are some sentences about movie reviews, which Jasmine put in, because that's often what's being done, is he's taking movie reviews from Rotten Tomatoes and analyzing sentiment in them. So the movie was bad, is mostly negative, has a com compound score of negative 0.54. Very bad movie, somewhat more negative. Very, in capital letters, see, Vader can figure that one out. Even more negative, very bad movie, exclamation mark, most negative of all of these scores. Okay, so what we want to do is um, not score an entire review or an entire section of a review. We want to focus on a specific topic, work-life balance. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we do something called aspect sentiment analysis, um, which means we analyze the context around terms denoting work-life balance, so all that lexicon terms. And we look at words before and after those terms and say, are those words positive sentiment, negative sentiment, or neutral sentiment? And that gives us a, a sentiment of what, how they're expressing work-life balance. We use three-word windows, um, and we, in these windows, don't we take out all the common words like the, or, and, for, but. Um, and, oh, actually, we don't take out or, which turns out to be important later. Um, we sum the sentiment scores across all mentions of work-life balance. So for each phrase, word or phrase, that, meant that, that denotes work-life balance with the words before and after, we look at the total of that, that sentiment that gives us a score from plus one to minus one. For every sentiment score in a, in a text, every, sorry, every word devoted to work-life balance, denoting work-life balance in a text, we calculate its sentiment score and we, add, we sum that up and we get a total work-life balance mix. So if you talk about work-life balance using three or four terms in a review and it's very positive, it is positive all the times, then that becomes a very positive review. If you talk about it once and it's positive, it's a slightly positive review. Well, if you talk about it three times and one time it's positive and two times it's negative, that's a slightly negative sentiment in the act. So, oh, sorry, we also um, validated this, uh, this two ways because the computer's doing this and it's like, do I really trust Vader? Um, according to Star Wars, you shouldn't trust Vader. Um, so we looked at the star ratings that employees have given for work-life balance. So the reviews don't just have them write stuff. They rate the company overall, and there are optional ratings. So I think about 80% of people rate it for work-life balance. And the, the, the ratings are indeed, the, the correlation is indeed positive. Um, and we look at reviews that have high, low, and neutral scores to see what they look like. And they look like what you'd expect. And in the paper that I've written, we have examples of those that we talk about. Okay, results. Who mentions work-life balance? That's the first question. <clears throat> Here's all the results summarized for you in one slide. Female, female employees are, as we predicted, more likely than male employees to mention work-life balance, 34%. Employees at the mean age for the workforce, it's a relatively young workforce, are the most likely to mention work-life balance. 
So the mean age is 34. People 10 years younger are 21% less likely. People 10 years older are 10% less likely to mention work-life balance. Um, we find, so that's as we expected. We also find as expected a stronger effect for female employees than male employees. The gender gap in mentioning work-life balance is widest at age 42, which is at the 70th percentile of employee age. So it's still sort of in the middle, but a little on the upper end. You can see that here. This is the odds ratio. So the probability of a woman versus a man mentioning work-life balance in a review. Um, and the minimum in this graph is, because at the minimum age is uh, 18, is women, are, women who are 18 years old are on average 10% more likely than men to mention work-life balance. Women who are between, say, 33 and 54 are about 40% more likely than men to mention work-life balance. Um, people who are in their 60s, women are still one-third more likely to mention work-life balance. Okay. We also looked at context, remember? Um, and the gender gap is, as we expected, smaller for publicly traded firms than privately held firms. It's 20% smaller. Um, a bit, 6%, 33, 6% is 20%. Um, it's the gender gap for larger firms is the firm range, age size range is enormous. Um, at the mean plus one standard deviation, um, it's 10% less. If you have a mean minus one standard deviation, it's 10% more. So these results are based on the logistic regressions. Of, so they have fixed effects for industry, region, and year. And they also have dummy variables for whether you mentioned compensation and perks, because you might be fine with work life balance if they pay you a ton of money and give you free food with fancy chefs. So this is support for all our hypothesis. My conclusion is I'm a genius. And then we go work on the second dependent variable. And it turns out I'm not. OK, we do a robustness check. Nothing you can do to the data makes the results go away. This is our now do rigor for um, quantitative analysis. So we have tons of data. We can analyze subsets of the data and do all sorts of things. And that's what we find. It all works out. Um, now, opinions about work-life balance. OK, so this is the distribution of, re of the, the review scores, whether it's a positive, negative, or neutral review, um, for work-life balance. And you can see most employees like their work-life balance in the tech sector. Um, there have been what I can only describe as non-representative surveys by market research firms who found something similar to this. So it's not entirely a surprise. Um, but I am surprised about how few employees find work-life balance to be a problem. So they would be at zero or below zero here. Um, so like, OK, let's see what's going on. There's still variation that we can explain, right? Well. Here's some example reviews, right? So here's a positive review. I'm so happy I've made the jump to pay loss. And my quality of life has increased exponentially in our analysis. That would be a positive phrase. I can't mention we're going back to. I haven't hit it yet. Um, due to the fantastic work-life balance, that's a very positive thing. So that ends up giving us um, a positive score of 4.2. Neutral score. Nice building, plenty of perks, work from home, not really an option, but it's just nice, it wasn't a big deal. It's neither positive nor negative. Negative score, poor work-life balance, no work from home, family emergency, not understandable. So that's like very negative score. Um, so you can see that these things map on to what you might expect if you were hand coding them. Okay, here's the results of our regression analysis. Here's where I'm not a genius. Despite the fact that female employees are more likely to bring it up, they're no more likely than male employees to express positive, negative, or neutral sentiment about work-life balance. I am freaked out by that. Um, so employees um, who are in the 30th percentile are most likely to express a positive sentiment. So they're younger than the people who are likely to have um, small children, but they are. Uh, it, it's not like exactly what we expected. And there's also no interaction with Gender. There's nothing I can do to make gender work in this analysis, basically. There's no interaction between gender and firm ownership. There's no, there is a significant interaction between gender and firm size. However, it's the opposite to what we would expect it. Larger firms have larger gender gaps and express sentiment about work-life balance, even though we thought that that would be the opposite. Um, so we basically have support maybe for a hypothesis. I'm not even sure about that. 
So what do we do? We pivot. Heck, they pivot all the time. I should pivot too. Um, so basically we're thinking about, maybe they're talking about it differently even if they express similar positive, negative, or neutral emotions about it. Um, so we inductively coded themes in a random sample of 240 reviews. So we stratified the reviews by positive, negative, neutral, randomly chosen in those three subcategories um, and used max QDA to code themes. Here's what we find. There's almost no really strong emotional content among the reviews, so it's, things are clustered around zero a lot. But many employees in their reviews were concerned that firms did not have standardized work-life balance policies. Instead, managers can basically decide how much they're going to offer employees in terms of work-life accommodation or not, right? Um, outside, of, there's no difference in these themes about standardized work-life balance or the lack thereof between male and female employees. So we're still puzzled. But that's what we have in our data. Okay, conclusions, quickly, because I'm running out of time. Um, so basically, we find what we expect uh, in terms of the salience of work-life balance for employees, um, that you know, women more than men employees who are likely of the right ages to have young children and um, are more likely to mention work-life balance, um, and they're less likely to do so in larger firms and publicly traded firms. But we find that employees are mostly in the tech sector are mostly satisfied with their work-life balance, but they are all, male and female alike, concerned about lack of standardized policies, which means managerial discretion over who gets accommodations for um, emergencies, et cetera. So our conclusion, because you know, I'm partly in a business school, um, is that all employers, large or small, public or private, might benefit from designing cafeteria-style work-life balance policies with workers able to choose the options that fit their particular situations. Because there, if even 29-year-olds are concerned about work-life balance or they're thinking about it and younger workers and older workers are, are concerned about it in a more negative way, then you really have to think about employees who are different stages in their lives, employees with different kinds of responsibilities and offer different options to different employees. Okay, that's the end of the talk. I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. And here's my email address and Jasmine's email address and you can ask her all the hard questions, I will punt those, and she will try to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Heather. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, I think also particularly the kind of contributions methodologically are very interesting, as well as the findings themselves. So if people would like to ask a question. Oh, we've got one already. OK, um, let's hand over to Sugat. Would you like to introduce yourself, um, where, you, where who you are and where you're from, and then ask a question to Heather? And if anybody yeah. else... You can either put their hand up and ask it directly, or if you prefer, you can put it in the chat. So go over to you. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Herman. Thanks a lot for this very interesting presentation and very interesting data set as well. Um, I'm a research fellow at SPRU, working on Pillars project with uh, Professor Sabona. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I was really fascinated by these Glassdoor reviews and the and, uh, topic of issue, uh, to topic related to work-life balance of women, because it, it closely connects to my own research in India, where I find that women are less likely to apply for jobs which require travel requirements or night shifts, and they, they prefer work from home jobs as well. Uh, in this case, one, one of my concerns uh, was about the fact that, in general, the people who post reviews on Glassdoor they might be more likely to be the ones having very positive kind of sentiment towards a job or, or something which is more negative, right? So it's a selected sample of people. Um, so, uh, I mean, if, if women are overrepresented compared to men on uh, in, in these reviews compared to their representation in the tech sector, then that, that might also tell us something. Okay, so I can answer that. Um, so we looked at the, the fraction of people who identify themselves as female in the reviews as about a third. The fraction of, of people working in the tech sector is 28%. So it's pretty close in terms of representation. Um, and are the people who, can you guys hear background noise? Our neighbors are having foundation work done. No, you sound fine. 
Okay, good. I just want to, because I can move if I have to. Um, so uh, the other thing is that um, the, the Glassdoor is a give to get model. So basically in order to get access to Glassdoor to, to do a job search, right? So employees, people use the Glassdoor reviews to look at what goes on inside companies, hence the name Glassdoor. It's a door through, it's a window that you can peer into companies based on what their employees say. Reviews are anonymous. Um, and um, employees post these, whether they love the job or hate the job, and they do this in order so that they can find more information on other companies. Um, over half of US white collar job workers, job, uh, workers use Glassdoor to, to look for um, when they're looking for a job. So you have to you have to provide a review. That means that we're less likely to get the thing that happens in websites like Yelp or Rotten Tomatoes for movies, um, where you've got an extreme distribution, more at ones and fives and very few twos, threes and fours. Uh, for Glassdoor, the reviews are actually pretty close to unimal, uh, you, uh, sort of an equal distribution. There's a little upward bias. So there's Almost the same number of ones as twos, but a little more twos. There's a little more threes than twos. There's a little more fours than threes, and there's a little more fives than fours. So the average is 3.48, um, and it would be three if it was exactly even distribution. So it's not like we have a weird selection in terms of the people who are writing them, in terms of gender, and in terms of they're writing these reviews because they're pissed off or they're really thrilled um, about their company. So. Uh, we, if, it's still not a random sample by any means, right? Nor is it a population of employees. If, if I may add one more comment, I, I was quite surprised by the sentiment being, sentiment around work-life balance being uh, similar for men and women. And I was just thinking, could it, could it be the case that if some different sentiment analysis tool is used, for example, transformer-based tools such as Roberta, does it make a difference because Vader, Vader is quite old and, yeah. you know, again, it, it might help, uh, there might be more noise in Vader, so that's why it equalizes yeah. across two. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Um, and right now the paper's under review, so we'll see what the reviewers suggest, but we could use Roberta. Um, so transformers, for those of you who don't know, are computer algorithms that actually look at context to come up with an understanding of the meanings of words. Um, and you can use those to then the, the, the ascribe words to being positive, negative, or neutral in sentiment. Um, Vader is a lexicon and grammatical and syntactical um, rule-based analysis. Um, so it all comes from outside based on human coding. Um, and so there may be more flexibility if we use a different algorithm. So that's probably makes sense to think about doing that. Yeah, which will make Jasmine pull her hair out, but that's okay. Thank you very much. Aisha, do you want to introduce yourself? And Sure, thank you. Hi, my name is Asya. I'm a lecturer in work and employment relations here at the Leeds University Business School, um, sociology background as well. Um, thank you for that talk. Um, and thanks for sharing all the kinds of things that have come up that have made you kind of rethink some of the research and the hypothesis. Um, one of the things I was thinking about was your analysis of the words around work-life balance. So kind of thinking about it in a broader overview um, and whether there was any investigation, and I don't even know if this is possible really, but whether there was any investigation into what people were seeking work-life balance for. Um, and the reason I'm asking that question is just because yeah. understanding that it's you know, women are much more likely to talk about work-life balance at a, in a certain age group, 34, et cetera. The understanding is that work-life balance is for taking care of families, um, for care work, generally speaking. Um, just just kind of point to mention yeah. many years ago, pre-pandemic, I'd attended a presentation that was talking about how single younger people were using flexible policies and organizations to take care of their pets. Um, and I was just really reminded of that now um, as <laughs> going through these yeah. results. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just I'm, apropos of that, I just want you to know who's listening to the oh, talk. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. One of my kittens. Anyway, Leo. Um, yeah, no, totally. Um, that's actually why I'm working at home, because there's kittens. Um, so yes, uh, that's true. And so we actually looked at 
work-life balance in terms of two dimensions and then a sort of general thing. One was based on flexibility, time, and location, which is the kind of thing that young people who don't have kids or older people who want to go on trips and stuff like that because they have all their money um, are, are more likely to spring up than family responsibilities. And when we did that analysis, we just looked at who brings up family responsibilities, who brings up flexibility in time or location, we have the same results across both of those. We also looked at this, we thought it would be women more than men, but it's like the same results, basically. Um, so the other thing is that um, we thought that men might be more likely to bring up uh, just general work quality of life terms or work balance things. So that there's they, they, women are still more likely to do that. So we've looked at the, try to get the content of um, what people are meaning when they say work-life balance um, based on our, our, our lexicon of terms. And as we haven't, we, so Jasmine did an extensive review of the literature to say, are there more dimensions of work-life balance than this, right? Um, and basically these are the two main dimensions and then there's this just overarching category. So if you happen to have any other ideas, I'd be happy to try to find more terms and look for that. But I think you've hit the hit on the mark. But no, there's no difference, which may mean that these men are much more enlightened than I expected them to be. Maybe. Right. Yeah, we'll think about it. Do you think, sorry to follow on, do you think you could do that analysis outside of the U.S. or for different different communities of people? Yes. Depending how you yeah, I, I gave this talk at the Stockholm School of Economics in September um, when we were still finishing it up. We submitted the paper in November, so I should get reviews soon. Um, and um, this, the people at the Swedes and the Norwegians and the and the Finns who were in the audience, basically, mostly who was there, were all going like, this is not the way it's like. No, in the Nordic countries, we have a whole different thing. Um, so I think um, if I got access to data on other countries, it'd be very different things brought up in the reviews. What I have access to, unfortunately, is just the U.S. I didn't think to say, can I have worldwide law? But um, I, I would love to see what people are talking about in other countries and how they're framing it. Because in the U.S., it's so everything is individualized. It's all your responsibility. Um, and there's very little um, national, much less local support, state level support for um having children, looking after old people, right, so. You know, it's fascinating research. I do think you'll get lots of different national differences. I remember even, sorry, an anecdotal level, in Germany, when we had a kids at kindergarten, people went in at seven or eight o'clock in the morning and took their kids at two or four, Monday yeah. to Friday. But in the UK, people were in the mornings, in the afternoons, two or three days. It was such a completely different individualized model in the UK where it's not like that in Germany. Right, let's hand yeah. over because another question is Karis and Sam. Karis, would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question? Yeah, um, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my name is Karis. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge and part of the Digit Doctoral Network. Um, I study uh, how hybrid and remote work affects women's careers in Bangalore in the tech industry. Okay. Um, so thank you. I really uh, enjoyed and found a lot of what you said very relevant. So thank you for that. Um, I just was wondering about, you know, piggybacking on what Asia said, um, something that I found when I'm talking to some of the women tech workers and HR reps is how quickly the jargon shifts as well. So when I was looking at something like diversity, they're like, oh, diversity is so 2017. Now we're talking about belongingness. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> That's happening at Berkeley too. We had DEIB, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and then when I was doing my lit review for it, I was, you know, the literature is still at, oh, how is equality different from diversity and now somewhat inclusion, but now they're talking about belongingness and how that compensates for differences in worker identities. Um, to the level of personality. So I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not quite sure. I don't think academically we've caught up yet to how quickly the jargon is moving. Um, but I don't know if even some kind of inductive work to figure yeah. out what that jargon is might help with- Yeah, and we, we can elections. look to see like what people are saying by, by year. We, you know, we can do an inductive, quantitative inductive analysis of like, has the has the have the terms related to work-life balance changed over time? I haven't thought about that, but um, 
Okay. I'm going to write it down. I have it in my note, right? In my piece of paper. <laughs> That's yeah, um, yeah, um, and um, and then kind of the other thing that I want to say with, with, with your assumptions of your organizational assumptions, um, something that is coming out in my research too, with looking at the, you know, when you can't go to work anymore and the office doesn't matter to like the big playgrounds of Google and um, Apple really matter. How do people compensate for all those perks that really drew people in in the first place? when everyone's working from home. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so yes, big companies are legally mandated, for example, in India to offer things like crashes and daycare and all these other things that startups aren't. But in a startup central hub like, like Bangalore, and I would imagine Silicon Valley too, the way that startups compensate for that is to just give massive bonuses and big payouts. And I think that somehow kind of then interferes with the earlier premise of, you know, maybe if you're getting paid enough, work-life balance doesn't matter. And if you're the kind of person that goes up after that startup job and you're getting paid so much more than your peers at an established organization, that you're going to be <clears throat> less likely to talk about, you know, so your premise holds, it's yeah. just the... Yeah, just that that's what I've been noticing with why people are, you know, less critical sometimes in, in startups, even though they have to deal with much worse conditions yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Um, and we could just look at the data for 2020. So uh, I got the data in October 2020. Um, and so we could say conservatively February to October 2020 would be a time when people were starting to think about this because it's the middle of March, the mandates for don't work and, and, uh, and we had to go to remote teaching overnight. Mm -hmm. um, so we could we could look just at that and see how much different that is, right? We have those data. I only have it till the beginning. This is pre-vaccine COVID, mm -hmm. right? And we also don't know what causes it and we don't know whether you're gonna get it from someone you pass on the street or ride your bicycle past them. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, my husband saw a family masked, but with no helmets, riding their bikes once on a bike path. And he was like, no, probability is higher for the bicycle accident than it is for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but no, that would be great. I think you're right that the, that the meaning of work and the way people are interacting changed. And we should probably do that as well. Thank you. That's a great idea. Thank you so and much. And I love the idea of saying is the vocabulary changed. Mm -hmm. Has the meaning of it changed? I think there's also really interesting points. But before I say anything else, Sam, would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question? Yeah, well, I'm Sam I, a professor of organizational behavior and human resource management at University of Surrey with a okay. strong sociology background. Thank you, Heather, for a very engaging uh, talk. Um, when you mentioned context, I got excited thinking that you go beyond firm ownership and size uh, to talk about say, the self-employed entrepreneurs, you know. Um, obviously, you have a very much an American data set. But if you were to go beyond your, your, your findings and just um, speculate on how female entrepreneurs uh, may be coping uh, with work-life balance, and especially in contexts which are uh, patriarchal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I would say the red states in the US. Um, but there may be, there are there definitely actually I cope. I can't write the word cope, sorry, with W L B slash C. Um, yeah, um, there are, there's probably actually data you can get on this. So there's a Global Entrepreneurship Monitor that is produced by the Kaufman Foundation. So Kaufman was some guy in Kansas, Kansas, I think, who wants to do people to do research on entrepreneurship. And they do a survey around the world every year um, to say, I don't know, to, I can look at the really small companies, but in the really small companies, it's not, it's usually employees, not the founders that are providing reviews. So I can't really look at entrepreneurs, but there are other data sources where you could probably get survey data and then you could augment it with interviews, obviously, um, of female versus male entrepreneurs in different countries, in different kinds of countries. So I can't do national context, 
I can try to nest um, the analysis in different industry contexts, but I haven't done that part of that. But I think you're right that there's there are other kinds of locational context um, that's going to vary. Um, so I, I think you're right that that's a really good idea. I can't look at entrepreneurs with these data because it's employees, but there are other sources where you could look at that. And I think you could take Harris's question and, and add to yours and go, and we can look at it pre and versus post COVID, right? And see how that works. That would be a really interesting contrast. Good. Thank you. They're really good questions. If anybody else has a question, please put your hand up because we still have a few minutes left. Um, I've got. I, I just want to let you guys know if you want the paper, I can send it to you because it's out under review. So there's a whole paper. Um, just to let you know. Is that the, the, um, the one that's on the? Is, is that different to the one that's on the digital? Did I do I mail it? I send it to you guys, so you have it. Okay, you have yeah, a whole paper. It's on the website. Yeah, it's on the website. It's on the website. Okay, great. Um, sorry, Suga, you had a question, so I'll let you go first. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess there's no one else. So I, I thought I'll just ask, uh, because I'm really fascinated by this kind of work. Uh, so is is there, are, are the differences the same outside the tech sent, uh, sector or is this something which is specific to tech sector? Because this is, uh, I mean, going beyond the tangent of looking across countries, but is this something which is specific to tech sector? Yeah, well, you'll be glad to know I have a paper where we're actually analyzing the entire um, sample of well, the entire population of Glassdoor reviews from the same time period, 2014 to October 2020, um, looking everywhere. Um, and right now we're doing some topic modeling, and you'll be very happy to know that we're using BERT topic. Um, so we're using transform based stuff. Um, and we've just done some hand labeling. We're trying to figure out which models that, that seem to be most interpretable and give us the least junk um, in terms of weird mixed things. Um, so we're still working on the on tuning the parameters. Um, but my plan is to do um, this kind of analysis across industries and across locations within the US that would, you know, there'd be like more. I'd be like, do people talk about different things in different kinds of places, right? So we're just basically doing an entirely inductive analysis. I don't have any expectations. Um, and so far, what we're finding is there's lots of subtopics within compensation, benefits, um, <clears throat> including just perks in general, um, jobs, career advancement, workplaces, meaning the, either the, the, the establishment they're working in or the company as a whole, um, and management and coworkers are the seven kinds of things that are mentioned. And there's like different kinds of things within that, those seven categories. And I even, don't even know how much one category or another is mentioned, but we're just trying to get a sense of what people are saying. And so I would like to do the kind of analysis you brought up. That would be awesome. That sounds Thank fantastic. You. Great minds think alike, because I had something similar. Yeah, so me and Sugat were like, you know, together. <laughs> well, I, mean, I had a similar question, but not as well eloquently worded as Sue gets one, but I think that's really interesting. And there was a topic we had at um, the Sarse conference in Amsterdam about the Leeds Labour Protest Index, looking at the idea of fractious connections and what's the most contentious issue. So in the case of that data was for um, platform workers, it was pay. So it was really yes. saying, is this topic is this topic, has it gone out of fashion a bit in terms of some of the concerns? So to frame to the context of that question, uh, I remember about 2000 when a Harvard Business Review came out with a special issue on work-life balance, much mm -hmm. to my astonishment of like, oh my God, how they actually care about this stuff. Feminists have been writing about it for decades and suddenly Harvard Business Review had discovered this topic, work-life balance. And I was quite surprised. And suddenly it seemed like in that period of around about 2000, 2004, working time issues were all on the agenda and governments in Europe were reforming the kind of regulations around working time. So the, oh. the question is, why is, is it, are we on a cusp of a wave of different things? So some of these yeah, yeah, yeah. become fashionable at particular times, governments or companies think they've resolved it and they get buried. And maybe some of the things you're finding is a kind of uh, consequence of some of those earlier changes. And I don't know if there are new ones there. So that, that, that was the first kind of question about, do you think there's a historical trends in which topics are 
hot and how that changes? Would that affect yeah. what you're doing? No, that would be one of the things I want to do. So I'm planning to look at a male-female divide. Um, I'm planning to look at different industries, different time periods in different locations. Um, and because we can easily compare firms based on their ownership structure and size, I mean, in number of employees, actually, um, which seems most relevant to workplace dynamics, um, that's giving us purchase to say we have 6.3 million reviews overall. Um, and so that once we get rid of short reviews and things and words, reviews that are not in English, um, and that gives us an opportunity to try to look at some of the stuff that you're talking about. Um, I think that work-life balance came back as a topic of concern during COVID because all these people, one of my colleagues, Matthias Devon said, I have a new job, kindergarten teacher, an assistant professor, right? You know, I'm like, Oh, great. That must be fun for you. And his wife, who was working for the Dutch um, government, they're both Dutch, um, the Dutch consulate um, had a total, her job totally changed during COVID, right? And in this little house with these two kids trying to figure it all out. Um, so I, I, it, it happened, there have been some studies showing that this has gotten worse for women. And there's a great, there's a great resignation of women more than men in a lot of jobs that demand a lot of time because they no longer can handle that when their kids can't go to school, right? So it, there's probably variation across the U.S. in terms of, well, there is variation in the U.S. in terms of how much the schools were closed um, and when they reopened. And so we could look to see to what extent that that's going on, but there's definitely in the press, et cetera, this, is, it, this became a newer, a, new, a topic that mattered again. So, well, Jackie, Jackie, the, the, the trend that you mentioned may sit very well within the context of uh, human resource sustainability, you know. Yes. Like with a growing interest in um, employee well-being and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then, you know, in the tech sector, they, they have chief talent officers and chief people officers, which, by the way, I want to do an analysis of this, seem to be mostly female. Um, and they're not really C-suite people. They're not really reporting to the CEO. Um, but because there's such a shortage until the last couple of months in the tech sector of, of, of good talent, that they have really elevated human resources to new terms, right? So it was from personality, human resources, and now there's chief people and chief talent officers. So I think you're right, Sam, that this has caused a change because of the way work is structured and what people are able to do. So, and, I, and work-life balance is just one term. It's just something that we're like, you know, people are talking about this. Maybe we should study this. Um, we were just, we're just, that was opportunistic on our part, which is why I wanted to do an open-ended inductive analysis of what people say when they talk about their jobs. Now, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And, and I wasn't saying that it's, you know, a dim or day out of fashion as yeah. When I went to do my PhD in Paris in the early 90s, the professor explained to me that feminism was no longer relevant because they'd solved it all in 1968. So that was why was I bothering to do a PhD on these issues? But so there's definitely fads and fashions. And I think there's a lot of things around racial inequality that weren't discussed pre-pandemic. They did, they really, um, agenda violence wasn't being discussed in the way it's been discussed now for lots of recent events. So it, there is clearly a change. And I think the point Karis made about uh, the changing dialogue and vocabulary, like the sense of belonging, it's a very interesting concept where that's come from and how that's changed the way we talk about what equality at work or means or not. But yeah, um, and, that, and that's something I can try to tra track separately from work-life balance, Karis. Um, so it's, it's fascinating because it's like, whatever people say, I can get, right? Whatever they don't say, I can't get, but at least we know something's important if there's a silence, right? Yeah, and so. I think your work is absolutely fantastic. I mean, methodologically, it's really innovative, it's really yeah. exciting to work on this way. So in the sense of keeping to time, because it's five o'clock here, and some people do have to go home and feed their families or not. Um, <laughs> or I send them, um, uh, so I, I will wrap it up now. Um, and we've got Gemma's put up here a short a little poll to um, ask your opinion of these the series. So oh, first cool. of all, I'd like to thank Heather very much because it's I've been a, a really interesting and exciting. So thank you very much for that presentation. We have next week's um, seminar with uh, Jean Im and Bruno Pallier. I'm afraid we have to postpone because in the UK we're on strike. So we're not going to have a digit debate on a strike day, but that will be announced when um, we have uh, when that will be available again. 
The one that will follow, thank you very much, Gemma, on the 29th of March, we will be having a presentation from Philip Stab, um, looking at counter-hegemonic neoliberalism that will be chaired by uh, Steve Rolfe. So I hope you're going to um, join us for that because it's a fascinating topic on looking at um, the regulation of AI market and uh, different issues around that and how that varies, for example, with some other regions of the world. So I hope you, it's a bit slightly different, but that's the whole point of Digit Debates. If you have suggestions of people you think we should invite, please let me know. You know how to get me on the website. And um, yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Lovely to see you. And thank you, Heather.